Hey guys, welcome back to TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. Again, it's TheClinicalTrialsGuru.com. Find me everywhere. I don't care where you find my content. I'm on every social network, so find me there. But if you're on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. If you're on the blog itself, first of all, thank you. And then second of all, make sure you subscribe because when I do things like giveaways or send out an email blast of a new project that I'm working on that you might be interested in or that may be applicable to you, you want to make sure that you're getting that list. Cost you nothing. Just go on my blog and sign up for my email list. All right, it's on the side of the blog, or it's in the it's in the my bio section. Same thing, right? So today I'm going to talk about phase one studies because I was talking to a prospective client about phase one studies. So they want to they currently do phase two through four studies, and they want to do phase one trials. So the first question I asked them is, hey, are you going to be doing this at your clinic or do you have another location for the phase one unit? Because it's kind of different, um, especially the operations and all the logistics is different in the phase one studies rather than the phase two through four. So what I explained was the best way to do this, if you can afford this, which most people won't be able to, is if you own your own building, your own facility, and you have enough space, let's say for example you have a two-story building, right? you can use the first floor to do your outpatient studies and then the second floor to do your inpatient studies. Well most sites, especially new ones, they can't afford this luxury. So what do they do? They have their outpatient clinic at one location and then they look to sublease bed space from either a hospital, a nursing home, a sleep center, an assisted living facility, whatever it may be, at this point you got to put on your business hat, your negotiation, your negotiating hat, and strike up a deal. Uh, and I'm not going to mention any numbers. I'll give examples, but numbers really vary wildly and drastically from state to state and city to city as far as bed space. I mean, it's just like real estate. You can't talk about real estate prices in Southern California compared to like Topeka, Kansas or someplace even more rural, right? So same thing when it comes to bed days, right? Some places charge $7,000 a night for a bed day, right? I was talking to one children's hospital here in Southern California. That's how much they charge per bed day, all right? That's one extreme. On the other extreme, you can go to like a assisted living facility and they charge a hundred dollars a night or you can find a sleep center for maybe two or three hundred so it's all about what you what you can negotiate with the sponsor when you're setting up your phase one study budget all right you want to make sure you get anywhere from twelve hundred a night to fourteen hundred a night and then you can negotiate whatever you can a lot of hospitals charge like nine hundred a night around here or more um, around here meaning southern california it might be more or less depending on where you are located. Um, sleep centers are good. Uh, surgery centers might be good. I know a lot of them have a lot of days where they're not using the office. And actually, some hospitals are even good. They have entire wings that are empty and they're not generating any revenue for the hospital. So they might be interested in working with you. And now you may have some leverage in negotiating a good bed stay price for you and for the hospital so it's a win-win for both and then you're making pure profit on the margin from what the sponsor is reimbursing you versus what you're paying of course you still have to pay your staff uh, you have to pay for the food and we're gonna get into that too um, a lot of phase one studies a lot of phase one protocols have very strict uh, meal or dietary requirements for the study participants. So you gotta make sure that either your facility can provide specific uh, meals, specific that uh, specific meal request or dietary request or dietary requirements from the sponsor. Or if that's not an option, you're gonna have to find a vendor who can who can deliver the food to your uh, phase one unit every night or for every meal so that's also going to come out of your margin 
ideally you want to find a study where the meal requirements are not that stringent, although that might become harder now than it has been in the past. Um, so that's that's one of the costs that's going to come out of the margin or out of your margin. Another thing is the security, right? You want to make sure that it's extremely restricted access to just the staff and the study participants. Another thing you want to make sure is that the study participants cannot just leave. They can't just come and go as they please in a phase one unit. If they agree to be in the study, they agree to remain in the facility and not go out, with the exception of supervised field trips, because a lot of protocols do allow supervised field trips. But as far as just like a study participant deciding to leave in the middle of the night to go to McDonald's and get something to eat, or even worse, maybe get something to drink, something with a little bit of alcohol in it, or maybe something to smoke, maybe with a little bit of THC in it, not good. Okay, so security is important. Um, another thing you want to look out for, especially in the psychiatric studies, but any study really, is having the staff supervision, so overnight staff. You might have to have an MD overnight. You might be able to get away with nurses um, for the evening shifts as long as the doctor is available on a call 24-7. Another thing, again, especially with the psych studies, but it should apply to all phase one studies, is windows, especially if you're on a second story or higher, or even first story if you don't want the study participants leaving or sneaking out and coming back in in the morning. Um, you, you're, you're always worried about the possibility of someone wanting to commit suicide. So that's something very serious that should be taken extremely seriously. So as far as the logistics of the operation, that's kind of um, how I would set it up. Obviously, you want to keep them entertained. You don't want them to be bored. So Wi-Fi, TV, video games, uh, computers, all that kind of stuff. Maybe even some kind of group activity. Um, I used to do field trips with our study participants. When the protocol permits it, we went to Angel Games. Um, again, I had to make sure study participants there were not ordering beer, so I always had to keep them in my eyesight. Um, so things like that as far as the logistics and then, yeah, the hardest part I guess at that point would be to get the study. And uh, of course you need crash carts and all the emergency equipment all the emergency equipment that you would need at your outpatient clinic for phase two through four studies you'll need there but even more so more of it and you may need special phlebotomists uh, so in the outpatient trials the blood draws are usually pretty straightforward you get a blood draw or two at each visit uh, some visits you don't even get a blood draw well in a lot of these phase one studies you gotta get a blood draw especially after they dose you got to get a blood draw like every five minutes, every 15 minutes, every two minutes. They want to see the PK of the drug and how it's uh, being absorbed in the blood during X amount of time period from when they took the first dose or second dose or third dose. So it's a lot of blood draws. What a lot of sites do in those cases where there's more than like 30 blood draws in a day is they just keep the, um, the tube in there and they have an open, I think it's called an open uh, stem or something, but you need to find a phlebotomist or a nurse who can actually do this or an LVN and rather than poking the study participant every time they need a blood draw, they just put another tube in there when they need it. So you need comfortable chairs. Again, depends on the study. If you need consulting help, I can do this. I've helped a lot of sites set up their phase one clinics. As you can see by this question, I'm in the process of continuing to help other sites. So let me know. All right, this is Dan from theclinicaltrialsguru.com, and then we can do all that stuff for you, like recruit subjects, find the studies, uh, negotiate the budgets, make sure your SOPs are correct, which you're going to need. What I recommend is having a separate set of SOPs for your phase one unit, and then keep a separate set of SOPs for the phase two through four, because should the FDA audit either one of your places, you don't want them seeing the other SOPs because then they can ask to go there and audit that site. You want to keep the FDA away, not because you're doing anything bad, but because who needs the FDA for an extra day when you just can separate your SOPs. All right, so give me a call, 949-415-6256. I can help you out. 
or email me dan at the clinical trials guru.com and hopefully this question will help you take care